Hello everyone, welcome. I'm Frances Lannan, Principal of LMH, and it's a very great pleasure to welcome you here today to the Howarth and Smith Lecture, and in many cases to welcome you back. Great to see you. So just a word of introduction of our speakers, and then I will swiftly hand over to them. So Don Howarth and Suzelle Smith are visiting fellows at LMH, where Suzelle took an MPhil before studying for her Juris Doctor at University of Virginia Law School. Don Howarth studied at Harvard, taking his BA, MA and JD there. They are the founding partners of Howarth and Smith Law Firm, based in Los Angeles. Suzelle and Don are very widely respected, and I want to add, in some quarters, rightly feared, <laughs> trial lawyers. <laughs> they have an exceptional record of effective litigation. Here at LMH, their series of annual lectures is now long established. It has recently included uh, developments in the criminal law of corporate responsibility, which made me, as the principal of this college, very worried indeed. Uh, they've also talked about issues in legal malpractice, and last year, historic legal challenges to the employment practices of the great Hollywood movie studios. A feature of these lectures, which I have particularly enjoyed, is their characteristic combination of legal theory and hands-on legal practice. Today's topic is very timely as we begin to approach in June next year the 800th anniversary of the sealing by King John of the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, which has had such a profound effect on the development of law and constitutionalism in this country, the United States, and globally. And speakers this evening are going to be looking at processes in lawmaking and constitutional development uh, following the influence of Magna Carta. So we are extremely fortunate to welcome back to LMH and back to this series, guest speaker, Professor Dick Howard, who is White Burkett Miller Professor of Law and Public Affairs at the University of Virginia Law School. <laughs> Professor Howard was a Rhodes Scholar and indeed will be speaking to current Rhodes Scholars tomorrow evening. He is a distinguished expert in constitutional law, comparative constitutionalism, and the Supreme Court. And he has received many awards in recognition of his scholarship and his work as an educator. Hope you'll allow me to say this, Dick. Professor Howard has taught at University of Virginia Law School for 50 years. Can that be true? They tell me so. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> and I should mention that he taught Suzelle there some few years ago. <laughs> and he has a recent LMH graduate in one of his classes right now. Lucky student. <clears throat> Among his many published works, Professor Howard has written about the influence of Magna Carta on constitutionalism in America. He combines theory with practice and has advised on actually writing new constitutions in many parts of the world, especially in former communist countries. Now at this point I might expect to invite Professor Howard to give the first presentation, but I'm actually going to give that honour to Suzelle as a former student of his and a trustee of the University of Virginia Law School. Thank you. 
So I did want to say a few words about my former professor, and I want all of you to know where we're going, the sort of roadmap tonight. So Professor Howard is the sun of tonight's presentation. Don and I are the moons, which will circle his presentation. So he will be the principal speaker about the, the Magna Carta and uh, the effect of the Magna Carta on the United States with a little bit of British history thrown in. But Professor Howard, who I can now call Dick after these years, um, was my professor at the University of Virginia in constitutional law. But he told me that while he was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, that he had a special, special fondness for Lady Margaret Hall even then. And it didn't have anything to do with academics. It had to do with visiting the women of the college on, on social, social occasions. But I think he compared the LMH students to the Christchurch men and figured that LMH was uh, a better place to be most of the time. He is going to uh, start out. And I wanted you to know that among his many honors and his many awards, he has always voted the most popular professor at the University of Virginia Law School. And I know that all of you will understand why after you hear Professor Howard's remarks. Thank you. My heart is always in my throat when a former student introduces me because you don't know what they're, do they remember the bad grade you gave them? But I never gave her a bad grade. She was one of the absolute best. Thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate the hospitality of the principal and, and our friends at Lady Margaret Hall. It's uh, just a great, it's a great treat to be here for an academic reason and not those lesser reasons in the, in the old days. Uh, as the principal said, we celebrate the or mark the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta next year. We're in the run-up to that now. Um, it was A.A. A. Milne who introduced me to King John. You remember now we are six? King John's Christmas. Do you remember that poem, King John was not a good man? He had his little ways, and sometimes no one spoke to him for days and days and days. <laughs> you remember that? Well, I mean, I was just a kid when I read that, and I didn't think anybody could be that bad, but then I grew up and read about King John, I discovered he, he really was that bad. Um, so we, but we do have him to thank him in a curious sort of sense for giving us Magna Carta. Um, I don't have to tell an audience in this country about how Magna Carta came to be and why it was important to English jurisprudence. Uh, it, of course, was sealed on June 15th in 1215, uh, thanks in good part to King John's hapless reign, his wars in France, his quarrels with the Pope, his disputes with the Baron, and he made enemies at, at every quarter. The result was Magna Carta, and I'm sure you know that among the much of Magna Carta had to do with, of course, medieval feudal relationships and the like. But um, the one section, the one provision that stands out and really matters, it's the point of departure for our discussion this afternoon, is what came to be called Chapter 39, and that's the provision that says that no one should be preceded against save by the law of the land. Now, law of the land in a century or so after Magna Carta became interchangeable with what we today call due process of law. So that's where, that's where it basically comes from, and I doubt the barons of the 13th century were much concerned about <laughs> posterity. They were trying to settle an immediate quarrel with the king. And it's pretty clear that King John didn't mean to keep his con promise. Magna Carta might have died out altogether, but King John died the next year, 1216, and the advisors to the successor, Henry III, who was nine years old at the time, casting about, no doubt, for some way to sort of prop him up so he might survive to manhood, said, well, let's reissue Magna Carta. And that's what they did. And that began a long tradition of reissues of Magna Carta until it went on the statute books of England in 1297. Um, there was an interesting statute of uh, Edward III in the 14th century that declared that Magna, if, if a statute were incompatible with Magna Carta, then it should be holden for none, in other words, null and void. I mean, that's not a modern constitution. Obviously, one statute can't trump another, but uh, I think what it was was a direction to judges to say that Magna Carta has a special 
status in, in litigation. Well, let me fast forward to the 17th century. Again, with this audience, I don't have to tell you about the remarkable events of that century in England, uh, but it was, I think, constitutional historians would say that was the great uh, churning moment when something like the foundations of modern English constitutionalism <coughs> took form. I mean, the century in which we saw the Petition of Right, uh, the Habeas Corpus Act, the English Bill of Rights of 1689, and then, of course, at the end of the century, the Act of Settlement. And one of the great uh, actors on the stage at that, in the early part of that century was Sir, Ed, Sir Edward Cook. Uh, his great commentaries on Magna Carta are, of course, part of English jurisprudence. He was also the Parliament's leader in challenging the pretensions of the Stuart Kings. And he said, in effect, that uh, Magna Carta is such a fellow he will have no sovereign. That Magna Carta was, he, he basically reintroduced, as it were, brought Magna Carta back to stage center. Well, that was the beginning of those struggles in the 17th century. And since my story this afternoon is mostly about Magna Carta's influence in America, that century is important from the American perspective. If you think about the 17th century, it's nicely bracketed by the first English-speaking North American colony at Jamestown, 1607, and the last of those colonies was Georgia in 1701. So what was happening on the American side almost perfectly fits and brackets what was happening on the English side. Now, the colonial charters, Virginia's being the first permanent settlement, uh, typically had provisions uh, the, James, the Virginia Company Charter of 1606, for example, had a provision that said that if you immigrated to America, if you became a colonist, then you carried with you what the charter called the liberties, franchises, and immunities that you would have enjoyed in the mother country. Now, if you were a <coughs> colonist in Sp a Spanish colony or a Portuguese colony, there would have been no counterpart. I mean, those colonies were being ruled directly through viceroys from Madrid or Lisbon. <clears throat> but <clears throat> the English-speaking colonies had these provisions that, I mean, it's sort of like a travel poster in a travel agency. You want to go to the beaches of the Bahamas and you see the golden sands. It's that kind of thing. It says, you're not going to leave your rights behind when you go to Virginia. So the promise was not only to the colonists, but to their posterity these rights would descend to successive generations. Now, whether those who drafted those, uh, that language in London intended a full expansion of those rights, I don't know, but certainly the colonists took them seriously. Now, during the 17th and 18th century in America, as the colonies finally, they were fairly poor at beginning, law was rudimentary, but as you move from the 17th into the 18th century and the colonies prospered and trade was increasing, the law naturally followed, there were more and more legal transactions, and the introduction of English law was re reinforced. If you looked at a colonial law library, for example, you would certainly find Cook's Institutes and Cook's Reports. Obviously, these were English colonies, so naturally they were following English law. As they became prosperous, uh, the sons of planters and merchants would go back to London, study at the ends of court, and this was part of the reinforcement in America of the legacy of Magna Carta. Now, in the Revolutionary Era, the uh, French and Indian War breaks out in America, Seven Years' War starting in, 70, in the 1760s, in the uh, 50s, I'm sorry, 1756 in England and in, in Europe. Um, as that war broke out, of course, <laughs> all, I hope all American school children would understand that the problem that then festered was Britons, having spent so much money on the war, thought the colonists ought to pay their fair share, hence the Stamp Act and other revenue measures which were manifestly unpopular with the colonists. And as they began to shape protest against British policy, uh, they were put in constitutional form. I mean, it's interesting that Americans, before they even had a constitution, were thinking in effect like constitutionalists. And so in these petitions against British policy, they would say, they would remind the British in London of the 
Promises made in those colonial charters, like the 1606 Virginia Charter, say, you told us we had these rights, and now you're not keeping your promise. Uh, so they reached back a century and a half and brought those, those, those claims up into their present petitions. It was interesting eclecticism in those petitions. They were not simply confined to legal arguments. Those petitions did cite the colonial charters, they did cite precedents from English law, but then they mixed in a certain amount of natural law. Perhaps the influence of John Locke and the social contract theory, but there was a, sort of an, a mixture of eclecticism of basically saying, look, we have these rights. You can attach what label you like to them. You can call them charter rights. You can call them constitutional rights. You can call them natural law call them the law of God, whatever you like. The point is, we do have rights. So even before the Constitution was written, there was this interesting ability of Americans to be comfortable with rather diverse ways of thinking about the Constitution. So if any of you students who are here ever have reasons to study American constitutional law and find it messy, there you are from the beginning. It was not. It was never like French constitutional law. It was never neat and analytical. It was always rather a, a murky affair. After the revolution broke out, first thing the colonies sat down and did was write constitutions. And I'm fascinated, May 15th, 1776, in Williamsburg, Virginia, when British gunboats were in Chesapeake Bay and war was really beginning to heat up, uh, they said, clear to them they had to write a constitution. So in Williamsburg, on the day that the Virginia Convention instructed their delegates at Philadelphia to introduce the Resolution for Independence, which finally came about in July, uh, on the same day they set to work on a Declaration of Rights and Frame of Government for Virginia. Now today, if you look at an American state constitution, the Bill of Rights is typically Article I. It's one document. But in the thought of the early framers, they really thought of a two-step process. And this is really sort of, again, John Locke and the social compact. First thing you do is declare your rights, set them down, and then move on to the business of setting up a frame of government. So you, uh, then, then you come into a, a constitutional tradition. Now, at this point, it seems to me you trace Magna Carta's influence on the Bill of Rights side and not so much the frame of government side. So if I could just simply sum up what was Magna Carta's legacy as America began its constitutional experiment, I think I'd mention several things. And I think these are things that will matter as Americans today think about Magna Carta. One is simply the notion of the rule of law. No man is above the law. King John in the 13th century, uh, Richard Nixon in the 20th century, e equally confounded, confronted that principle. Secondly, the notion of articulating and restating fundamental rights from Magna Carta right on down through American constitutions. Thirdly, the idea of a written document. <laughs> of course, I say that in a country which is among the few in the world that has no written constitution as such, as we all know, but it seems to me Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, the other English documents were in effect preparing, laying the way for written constitutions in America. Fourthly, the notion that Magna Carta was not simply another statute, that it was special, that it was in effect a super statute, I think conditioned Americans to begin to think about a hierarchy of laws, including a constitution that through its supremacy clause would be used to strike down ordinary legislation. Finally, one of the legacies of Magna Carta is very much like the common law itself. The notion of an evolutionary, organic, unfolding uh, way of thinking about law. Not civil law of having a statute which a judge goes directly to to decide a case, but precedent. And change with each generation. One of the great debates in American constitutional law is between those who, like Justice Scalia, believe in the so-called original meaning. That you go back to the document, look at its words, find out what they meant at the time they were drafted. I think the dominant mode has been a different tradition, and that is what some people call the living constitution. The notion that you do reinterpret the language, not simply what it meant to the founders, but what it has come to mean in, in our own time. 
And the most interesting example is the one that we're going to be talking about this afternoon, due process of law, something which goes right back to Magna Carta and has been used in a remarkable numbers, number of ways. Now, due process of law could simply mean procedure. You can imagine fairness, notice, uh, the chance to tell your side of the story in court, a fair tribunal. It does, of course, mean all those things. But it has come to mean, certainly in American practice, substantive limitations on, on what government can do, quite beyond that of fair process and procedure. It's interesting that even before the phrases due process were put into the 14th Amendment to the Constitution in 1868, both state and federal courts in America were already beginning to suggest that the whole idea of government in a constitutional system implied inherent limits on what government was entitled to do. There was a case in 1815 where the state of Virginia tried to divest the Episcopal Church, the former Anglican Church, of its lands, and the Supreme Court said essentially that the principles of natural justice, even if you had no written constitution, principles of natural justice would deny government the power to do what Virginia had, had, had tried to do. Now, a quick look down through the years of the uses of substantive due process, it's interesting how it has risen and fallen with the ebb and flow of different economic and social theories. From about the end of the 19th century up until the 1930s, due process was used in particular to protect corporations, business interests, economic enterprise, uh, property, and the like. For, I mean, it was clearly to the justices of the Supreme Court, it was beyond the power of government to use their power to uh, to sort of recalibrate economic inequalities among its citizens. Redistribution was beyond the power of government. That, that, that came somewhat later. Typical case, uh, Lochner versus New York, a 1905 decision, was one in which the state of New York had passed a law saying that uh, bakers could not be made to work more than 10 hours a day. And the Supreme Court invalidated, struck down that New York law Justice Peckham, who wrote for the majority, uh, called it a meddlesome interference with the rights of grown men to decide for themselves how long they wanted to work. If they chose to work longer than 10 hours a day, they had the constitutional right to do that. I doubt that the working men of New York thought that was a great favor, but the theory was, interestingly enough, not that the state of New York had violated the constitutional rights of the employer, but that they had violated the rights of the employee, the one who was the, uh, the working man. And that was a typical, there were lots of cases like that where the court basically was second-guessing state legislatures and Congress on, on economic matters. Now, when the Great Depression came in the 1930s, after the crash of 29, that sort of jurisprudence was under increasing stress. You could just see why it was simply not possible to hold, continue to hold that line against government action. So after about the so-called constitutional revolution in 1937, the Supreme Court began to step aside and let legislatures get on with the business of dealing with social and, and economic problems so that uh, it became, it's not that these cases were not reviewed at all, but when the court heard attacks on these statutes, they would use a very deferential standard of review. And they would, it did, was not difficult for a state to persuade the court, here are conditions which support the police power in these particular cases. Now, I think the most interesting modern manifestation of substantive due process, I mentioned that in the late 19th, early 20th century, due process was being used to protect economic liberties. Starting in about the 1960s, the Supreme Court began to use substantive due process to protect uh, personal privacy and autonomy. Justice Brandeis once said that the right to be left alone was the most valued privilege of civilized people. And I think that began to spill over into the court's jurisprudence, beginning with what surely is one of the most interesting modern U.S. Supreme Court cases, Griswold versus Connecticut, 1965. Connecticut had passed a law forbidding the 
prescribing or use of contraception, contraceptive devices. Well, the justices all agreed this was a foolish law, but, but the problem was being foolish is what legislatures do all the time, right? <laughs> Here and in America. And does that make it unconstitutional? Well, the Supreme Court was divided over what to call it. Some didn't want to call it due process. Uh, Justice Douglas put together the emanations from the various Bill of Rights guarantees. But what it really was, was substantive due process. The court struck down the Connecticut law, and what they were saying was, this law is beyond the police power of Connecticut. Well, that set in motion of quite a series of interesting cases dealing mostly with family and personal matters. The decision to have children or not have them, the decision how to raise children, decisions about marriage, decisions about divorce, a whole cluster of rights began to be protected by the, uh, by the Constitution. Um, and it includes what has to be one of the most controversial modern U.S. Supreme Court cases, Roe versus Wade, 1973, where a majority of the court, seven to two, held that a woman's decision in consultation with her doctor to decide to continue or terminate a pregnancy was a constitutionally protected. Now, the subject to limitations and qualifications, but there was a central right of a woman to make up her mind free of state control about that decision. Uh, as we get to the current day, some of the most interesting cases have been about gay rights. And uh, there's no area in which I think jurisprudence and social ideas have changed so quickly as they have in this area. In 1986, the Supreme Court, in a case from Georgia, uh, rejected the argument that uh, relationships between two people of the same sex enjoyed constitutional protection. They simply said it's not within the American tradition, and if it's not, it's not protected. Well, that was a divided case, was five to four. 1986, 17 years later, in a case from Texas, Lawrence versus Texas, 2003, the court overturned, it, it overruled this 1985 case in a, an opinion by Justice Kennedy. Now, Kennedy, <laughs> this is not a seminar in American constitutional law, but he is one of our most interesting justices because sometimes you see him sort of reaching into his own conscience to decide what he thinks the Constitution means. And in, in uh, Lawrence versus Texas, Kennedy wrote for the majority in overruling Bowers versus Hardwick, 1985, and saying that decisions, in, in a sense, gay rights are protected by the Constitution. And I want to read a couple of, ex just a, a sentence or two from Kennedy's opinion, because they give you a sense of the remarkable vitality and evolving nature of due process of law. Here's what he says. He says, those who drew and ratified the due process clause did not presume to know the components of liberty, the components of liberty in its manifold possibilities. The time, times can blind us to certain truths and later generations can see that laws once thought to be necessary and proper serve only to oppress. As the Constitution evolves, as it endures, persons in every generation can invoke its principles in their own search for greater freedom. Clearly, this is the living Constitution in, in action. And Justice Kennedy then quoted one of his own earlier opinions. Justices like to quote their earlier opinions. He quoted an earlier opinion talking about these intimate personal choices that people make. And he says, these are choices personal, central to personal dignity and autonomy, and they are part of the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment. He then, I, go, I won't read the rest of the language, it actually begins to soar in a rather elegant fashion. You can see that he's actually kind of transported by the ideas that he's laying out. Now, that's the gay rights opinion. Now, one of, I'm sure my colleagues will get into this, but the current moment of debate is uh, same-sex marriage. And it's remarkable, again, I, I think I want to say that due process like the Supreme Court itself in the United States, has a way of tracking these remarkable changes in public opinion. I mean, it's not been many years since most people in America would say same-sex marriage, that's up to the states. 
you can't ban, you can't say it's protected by the Constitution. That's, that's quite, quite absurd. Well, the Supreme Court hasn't spoken yet, but we will find out, I expect, within a year or so, whether same-sex marriage will join these other categories of personal decisions protected by due process of, of law. These cases are working their way up through the federal courts, Virginia being one of them, and I'm sure we'll, we'll reach the Supreme Court in due time. A last word on substantive due process. Uh, I'm sure just as King John didn't like Magna Carta and was thought this was a, a, a simply an unnecessary restraint on his prerogatives as king, today nothing is sharper in American debate over our Constitution than the Supreme Court's uses of due process of law. I mean, you can imagine in all the examples I've just given, abortion, gay rights, <coughs> same-sex marriage, et cetera, et cetera, how sharply people are divided in the merits of those cases and how sh sharply the uh, people and justices and jurists and, and others are divided over these expansive uses of due process of law. The critics will argue this is a, an arrogation of the democratic process. It's for the legislatures to make these decisions. And they'll say that using due process in this sort of latitudinarian fashion is simply making it up as you go. I mean, they'll just pour their own meanings into the Constitution, and that's no way to read the Constitution. Others will argue that, as the early Supreme Court did in that Virginia case I mentioned, that uh, it's inevitable that justices are required to think about what is the essence of life in a constitutional liberal democracy. Well, that's what the debate's about. You will hear more of that, and I want to thank you so much for the chance to be with you this afternoon. Are you able to get that up? Good. Um, what I'd like to do for just a few moments, if you go to the first slide, is just walk through some of the footprints of what this concept of substantive due process has done to the law, primarily in the United States. So we start with the concept. What is the fundamental concept? It's these restrictions that impact fundamental right to life, liberty, and historically some to property. The driving forces of the doctrine in the U.S. have been sexual preference and reproductive issues, as you've heard, but also slavery and abolition and racism. So really getting down to nitty-gritty issues have driven the substantive due process. Next slide. I like to make this distinction at the outset. So if we think about due process as a process, we're talking about the things that Dick mentioned, the right to be heard, right to confront witnesses, a neutral decision maker, and so forth. That sounds like process. And then many of the issues are closely intertwined with equal protection. Equal protection in the law you can think of as horizontal equality. Someone here has these rights, you're making a distinction over here, and there's no difference that it's two men versus a man and a woman, no legal difference. Equal protection gets a number of these issues. And what's left up here is this concept of substantive due process, which as I note here, some would say is a contradiction in terms. It's either substantive or it's process. But we've got these fundamental rights Pursue happiness in an unrestrained way except by just, <coughs> equal, and impartial. Now, the equal and impartial can be equal protection. Due process, the right to pursue them through a process, but the just is what the substantive portion gets after. Next slide. Um, I want to mention six footprints of this in the U.S. law. Elevation of tradition, things that might surprise you in our law. Vested rights, natural law an establishment of a hierarchy of rights, instability, and the courts as super legislatures. So let's look at those just briefly, quickly on this tour. This is from Justice Scalia in a 1989 opinion. And what he's looking at is substantive due process, and he characterizes it as those rights which have been traditionally allowed or traditionally accorded, in this case parental rights, are not traditionally denied. Now, some would say, but I thought law was going to deliver me from tradition. 
I thought that tradition was what was out there and limited me, and I looked to the law to free me from tradition. Substantive due process, as interpreted by some, and it is a fairly open concept, as you've heard, <coughs> has been held to be tied to tradition. Next slide. Vested rights. This is from a 19, 1856 case in which the court held that the legislature could not say that rights which had once existed could be taken away, they exist no longer, and they tied it expressly to the law of the land, the formulation in 1215, which becomes due process of law. This one involved the liquor industry and upheld the liquor industry against the states. We may not be far from the concept that we have a fundamental right to drink. Uh, the um, uh, best uh, quote on that, I think, is from one of our, we're fortunate to represent the estate of W.C. Field through his grandson, uh, his heir. And uh, the quote I like best from W.C. Fields is the one where he said, everyone should have something they can believe. He said, I believe I'll have a drink. So he may have a fundamental right to it. Next one. Then those positivists in the audience who thought that uh, natural law had been squeezed out, uh, it may be like that whack-a-mole game that it's popping up again over here in substantive due process because you see these kind of quotes, this one from Justice Souter in 1998. Why is it unconstitutional by substantive due process? Because it shocks the conscience and violates the decencies of civilized conduct. These are not shocking the conscience or violating the decencies of civilized <coughs> conduct are not enumerated rights in our Constitution, our written Constitution. So he says it's not surprising. The constitutional concept of conscious shocking, so we have a conscious shocking constitutional concept, duplicates no traditional category of common law fault. It's not any other rule of law. It's a separate and independent substantive right not to be treated in a way that shocks the conscience, which leads to, next one, uh, our establishment of a hierarchy of rights by our courts. So if you read the opinions in this area, you will see that if a right has been classified ultimately <coughs> as fundamental under our system, it has to pass a strict scrutiny test. Congress passes a law that interferes with a fundamental right, for example, reproduction. If it's called a fundamental right, then the state has to have a compelling government interest in order to infringe it. If it's not classified as fundamental, if it falls under the all other rights, then there's only a legitimate government interest, a rational basis test, a much lower test. What I tell my students there is that what it really comes down to, if you can get yourself into the bucket of the strict scrutiny test, the individual wins, if you're in the all of the rights, the government wins. And so the whole issue here is where can I classify this right? Next slide. That, these last two principles, I think, show why, very clearly why this should be a moving target in the law. Because one person's shocking of the conscience, one person's meat may be another person's poison. Your conscience may be more impervious than mine is if I'm writing that decision. So I took this quote from a 1969 Supreme Court decision within our lifetimes, um, pronounced in the extreme statement here, the state has no business, no business telling a person sitting alone in his or her house what books he can read or what films he may watch. It sounded like bedrock in 1969. One of the most recent developments in our country, and I think here to some extent, is the issue of child pornography. And in the issue of child pornography, whatever you think about these issues, we're going right into what someone sitting alone in their own home may or may not watch or what books he may read. So substantive due process, because it is not hinged to some particular words in the Constitution, has led to a considerable degree of lack of prediction of change in the law over time, for better or for worse. I'm telling you this not because I'm advocating that there's something wrong with the concept, these are fundamental rights, but this is a footprint or an offset of the concept. Next one. 
The other is the criticism that we're open to of the courts as being super legislatures when you have this concept of substantive due process. Now this is not constitutionalism that we're talking about here, Marbury versus Madison, the Congress enacts a statute, is that statute, when you hold it up to the Constitution, does it pass muster or not, and who should decide? Is that the legislature, is that the courts, and under Marbury versus Madison, it's the court that makes that decision. This is a different concept altogether. This isn't the idea of somebody passing legislation which is inconsistent with some portion of the Constitution, but here is the idea that whether or not it is found in the Constitution, in addition to the due process, which you could read from here before it condemns the process, uh, renders judgment only after trial, process, the general rules, general rules which govern society, not the specifics of the Constitution, but when it violates what we see, what the justices see as these general rules, the conscience shocking and so forth, it can't be considered the law of the land. This is a famous argument of Daniel Webster, but it characterizes that line of thought. Next one. I looked just quickly to see about British analogs, to see if maybe this substantive due process you could write off as simply something that when this tree that was planted with Magna Carta got transplanted to the soil in America, the lesser soils perverted it, it went off on, on some tangent that, that didn't really make sense. But I find that you have similar concepts embedded today in your law. Uh, the doctrine of reasonableness and proportionality, whereby a judge is to make a substantive assessment of the well relative weight of competing interests. And this famous quote, my interns tell me, including my good help here today, of Lord Diplock, that his first ground he would call illegality, perhaps inconsistency between the law. Second, irrationality, I'll come back to. And third, procedural impropriety, due process as a process. Irrationality applies to a decision that is so outrageous in its defiant of logic or accepted moral standards that no sensible person who had applied his mind to the question to be decided could have arrived at it. So you here, I think, are right back with us in struggling with this concept of if we are going to have some rights that are so fundamental but nowhere enumerated that exist in the interstices of the law, in the penumbras, the shadows of the law, then we're going to have to deal with a judgment and somebody making a judgment about what accepted moral standards apply in that situation. So I conclude by offering you this not that I've helped, I hope, I, I hope I've made you, if you came in uneducated about this issue, uh, I hope you're uneducated and confused but at a little higher level after <laughs> listening to Dick. But I would leave this quote with you, go to that last slide. Uh, Churchill's famous comment on Russia, the rid riddle wrapped in a mystery or inside an enigma. Um, or if I, could, uh, if I could hark back to what... Uh, our client's estate, W.C. Fields, perhaps his famous quote where he said, uh, it is a difficult situation and perhaps that time when we need to grab the bull by the tail and face the situation. <laughs> <laughs>
and we have been participants in a same-sex marriage in the Anglican Church in Los Angeles, one of the first that was held in Los Angeles by the church. One of our clients came to us, a homosexual couple, some years ago, and it was their desire to be married. Now some of us may think that was a foolish desire, but whatever our, our personal opinions are, this couple wanted to have a marriage license. They wanted the imprimatur of the state on their union that they were lawfully married for different, different and sundry reasons which the courts have taken up in other cases as well. At that time, San Francisco, the mayor of San Francisco and the legislature and the, the authorities that issue marriage licenses were marrying same-sex <coughs> couples. So our clients were able to go up and get a license and become married. As a result of those marriage licenses being issued to same-sex couples, there was an initiative passed. I'll call it a law. It's an interesting law. It's a process we have in California where you can put something on the ballot and you can vote in and enact law by citizens, not through the legislature. So the uh, Protection of Marriage Act was passed by a proposition by the voters, by the majority, if you will, in California. And that law said that same-sex couples could not be married. In essence, it said only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in the state of California. So that was, that was a law. That was not the Constitution. The next thing that happened, the Supreme Court of California declared that law unconstitutional under substantive due process and equal protection grounds for the Constitution of the state of California, which mirrors much of what Professor Howard told you about and discussed with you in the United States Constitution. So the next step in the chess game was now we have a law saying that same-sex marriage is illegal. We have 18,000 people in California lesbians and gay couples who have been married. And their marriages remain legitimate, but no one else in California can get a marriage license. Then there was a proposition, I'm sorry, at that time, sorry, excuse me, the California Supreme Court says you can't, that law was unconstitutional, so you can become married. 18,000 people obtain marriage licenses. Then the opponents of same-sex marriage were organized. They had a huge political campaign, and they passed a proposition by this voter initiative, which would amend the Constitution of California. So they went one step up. They said, Supreme Court has said this law is unconstitutional. We will amend the California Constitution, Constitution and they did. And so the Constitution of California says only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California. So now you have the Constitution prohibiting same-sex marriage. A lesbian couple challenged this, who wanted to be married, challenged this law. It was Kristen Perry and her partner. They had, by the way, civil domestic union. The California law and civil domestic union gives most, if not all, of the rights of marriage, property, visitation, and so forth to same-sex couples. But the Perrys wanted, Kristen Perry and her partner, wanted to be married. They wanted the imprimatur and approval of the state to be married. The state refused the license because the Constitution had been amended where same-sex marriages were prohibited, and then the Perrys took their case to court to challenge that proposition that had become the constitu had become the constitution of part of the constitution of California the court went up through the the court that they went to was the federal court so it came up in California through the federal system the federal district judge who heard this case on the constitutionality 
of this clause now in the California Constitution actually had a trial. And the trial lasted for weeks. And people came and they debated and they put on witnesses about what is marriage? What is marriage? Is it simply a religious institution? Is it something that religion prescribes or religion approves or sanctions? Is this something the state is doing? Many, many questions about what is marriage and is there or is there not a constitutional right to be married if you are of the same sex. This is not what Professor Howard alluded to, gay rights in particular. It's a narrower subset of that. Gay rights, you can't discriminate in housing <laughs> or employment. But this was gay couples saying, we want a marriage license so that we can be like heterosexual couples and that our union will be recognized at law. The judge held the trial. He listened to witnesses. And at the end of the day, there's a very interesting, and I recommend it to you, opinion by the district court, a well-respected federal judge in California. At the end of the day, he said, under the federal constitution, not the state of California constitution, but the California constitution in this provision violates the United States constitution, the Equal Protection Clause and the Substantive Due Process Clause. This case went up through the Ninth Circuit and eventually ended up, and the Ninth Circuit affirmed the district court, and eventually ended up in the United States Supreme Court in 2013, I believe. The Supreme Court of the United States dodged the issue. Now, the practical effect for us as litigators is the United States Supreme Court said that the people who, the, uh, the proponents of the constitutional amendment did not have standing to challenge the district court's ruling. And that's a very lawyerly confused way to tell you that the district court opinion stands that the constitutional amendment is unconstitutional in California. That's the end game. But I say the Supreme Court skirted it because they decided this on standing grounds. They avoided the issue of fundamental right. Is there a fundamental right or not for same-sex couples to be married? So that issue will come up, as Professor Howard said, in another context. Now, strategically, with our clients, there are many of our clients who felt like the Perrys made a mistake <laughs> to push this issue at this point in time because of the Constitution of our United States Supreme Court at the current moment. Professor Howard mentioned Justice Kennedy. He wrote an opinion in another case called Windsor versus United States, which had to do with same-sex marriages. And if you have a legal marriage, can you be denied federal benefits under federal statutes? And the Supreme Court said, if there's a same-sex marriage that's lawful in a state, it must be recognized by the federal government. And you can't discriminate against that marriage where you would give heterosexual couples certain benefits. You can't take away federal benefits for same-sex marriages. But that drives us back to the states. That drives us back to the people in the 50 states and what the majority of the people in the 50 states will or will not do or say is appropriate or forbid and prohibit. So you might have a state like Hawaii, which says same-sex same -sex marriages are lawful. And you might have a state like Virginia, which would say same-sex marriages are not lawful. But the United States Supreme Court punted it back in the Perry case to the it to basically saying we're not going to hear the issue that is of critical importance. What is marriage? What is same-sex marriage? Is that a fundamental right? Now, you all have a fundamental right for your speakers not to go over their allotted time <laughs> that they've been given. So I was designated, hopefully, to end with the issue of same-sex marriage to uh, be provocative so that we can have a few questions here and then more, a more robust and vivid discussion over our drinks and dinner. But I want to leave you with some questions to think about 
on the issue of same-sex marriage, which I think so encapsulates the tensions that Don described about substantive due process. Does substantive due process in the United States Constitution or any Constitution prevent the state from denying the right to marry to anyone, to same-sex couples? Denying them the right to have a marriage license. Does the Constitution do that? As Professor Howard suggested when you wrestle with these other issues. Should it do that? Is the right to marry, to have the imprimatur, the marriage license, fundamental? If you get all the other social benefits under laws that protect same-sex couples, is there a right to call yourself a married couple or not? Is that a fundamental right? What is marriage? All the courts struggle with this. What is marriage? Is it a union between two people who can procreate? Is this some sort of contractual agreement for people between people to share property? Does this have something to do with having children and having children be legitimate? All of those issues, which all of us in this room might think we know the answers to, are being struggled with <clears throat> right now by the courts in the United States and the Supreme Court, even when it dodges the issue, the justices know those are the, those are the questions that should be answered if we are going to reach a principled, lawful answer to the same-sex marriage question. So I hope that was provocative enough for all of you to have uh, some questions for us on the panel. We have a few minutes, I think, before we retire for our drinks. So we have allocated that I will uh, entertain questions. You can ask questions on any subject. It doesn't have to be same-sex marriage. On any of the other things that the speakers uh, mentioned, we'll entertain questions now. And again, I want to thank Professor Howard for being with us and giving such a stimulating and wonderful presentation. And I want to thank Don for giving, I think, an equally stimulating and wonderful presentation. So thank you all so much for being here. I'll tell you not right now, any hard questions, I will defer to Professor Howard. <laughs> so yes, sir. Well, one boring lawyer's question and one comment. Um, who does have standing to challenge the uh, to defend the constitutional ban on same-sex marriages in California. Is it the legislator? Is there any legislator other than the people who propose the uh, constitutional amendment? And the boring, and the comment is, um, uh, we of course have outsourced a lot of these problems um, to the Strasbourg Court. But the Strasbourg Court returns um, some of them, perhaps um, uh, one, one could be um, impolite to say dodging the issue, but under the margin of appreciation, some of them come back to us and there is an issue as to how far uh, United Kingdom courts um, actually um, what their status is in relation to the legislator when the legislator is acting within what Strasbourg regards as the margin of appreciation. So I think we could have uh, similar problems. Of course, same-sex marriage is um, uh, already resolved by statutes, so uh, uh, nobody has challenged. <laughs> so the question is, for any of you who couldn't hear, the, the bottom line question was, who does have standing to, to bring the case to the, to the Supreme Court uh, the same-sex marriage, the constitutional issue that was raised in California. The, as I read it, and I'm here before my constitutional law professor who can, who can also answer that question, but as I understand the Hollingsworth case, the, uh, a member of the government of the state of California would have had standing to appear before the court. The um, attorney general of the state of California refused to do that. I think it was uh, Attorney General Brown. It's certainly when the case first came up, Jerry Brown, who's now the governor of California, was the Attorney General. He refused to bring it and in fact said that he believed that the uh, initiative was unconstitutional. So I don't know how, if I answered that correctly, but... Ab absolutely. This is why she got a B <laughs> in constitutional law. You know, Virginia, but, I mean, that's a wonderful, it's a judge's question in this case, but also a lawyer's question. Nothing is more malleable in American constitutional practice than issues like standing. And it's very convenient that the Supreme Court or another court really doesn't want to reach the merits of a case. They'll find ripeness, its case is not ripe yet, or it's moot, or in this case there has no standing. It basically buys time. 
because it was clear to the Supreme Court that the issue would come up again. Uh, Suzel mentioned the Hollingsworth case, that's the California case. The Windsor case, the one in which the court struck down the Federal Defense of Marriage Act case, again they sort of bought time in that case because that was a federal statute. The court struck down that federal statute, but they didn't again reach the ultimate merits question, is there constitutional protection for same-sex marriage? It, it will come up again. It's now being argued in two federal courts of appeal, the Fourth and the Tenth Circuits. Cases are being argued this within the next few days, in fact. One of those cases will reach the Supreme Court in the next term. It's interesting that on the standing question, how often public officials like the ones in California refuse to defend a statute even though the Supreme Court hasn't yet reached those merits. There's, I mean, there's no definitive Supreme Court case yet saying same-sex marriage is protected by the Constitution, but attorneys general and other public officials, Virginia being among them, are saying, in effect, they're predicting what the Supreme Court will do. Virginia's attorney general stepped aside, refused to defend Virginia's statute. What then typically happens is if the public official doesn't do it, someone else who does have standing will step up to the plate and defend the statute. So the issue gets joined on the merits, but those who think that the law is not constitutional are really out of the picture. So basically, I think it's a time-buying sort of thing. It will not, or you will know, I predict within a year's time, maybe a little more, the answer to the question we're talking about today. So by that point, you will have forgotten what we predicted. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't blame any of us for, for what the answer Dick, is. Dick, in the, in the two cases that are in the process now are both by a government official, would both avoid the standing as enunciated issue that this is already? Well, in the, uh, yes, in both. So that, that wouldn't be that issue. That, 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 that's correct. To say the standing issue would interest lawyers like us, clearly. Yes. Can I just yes. follow on from that answer? Yes. Because it looks as if, uh, from the scheme of things as interpreted by Professor Howard, that the courts are asking themselves what decision would be acceptable? Because there are other states which have struck down the same sex marriage. I, I, I think what has happened is that uh, in places from states where it is acceptable, people have gone into states where it is not acceptable mm -hmm. and tried to get some kind of recognition that their marriage in another state is to be recognized in the state which has not found it acceptable. So are we looking at a question which is actually over and above substantive due process, and that is to what extent, when judges are making a decision on an issue as sensitive as this, are they really looking to see whether that decision is acceptable? And if so, what should they be looking at? Public opinion, the opinion of the state legislature, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the people, the, the litigants, or, or who? Whose opinion should they be looking to? So, so the question is, whose opinion should the judges be looking to when they are deciding either to decide the question or to back off from the question and not decide the question? And I am going to let Professor Howard answer this one because he lives and breathes the United States Supreme Court and is intimately familiar with the personalities and many of the lower justices on the uh, district court uh, and federal court levels. I will just say this as a lawyer and a citizen looking at it and talking to clients, the United States Supreme Court composition at the moment makes a lot of people nervous because there are five considered to be conservative votes, four considered to be lim liberal votes. I think Professor Kennedy would probably be the fifth vote that is, is, is in the middle of that. But the composition of the court will be hugely important. If it comes up two years from now, we could have a different composition. President Obama can appoint someone of the conservatives. If one of them goes off and he appointed someone, then that would change the balance. If not, the balance could change the other way. But Professor Howard. This is a wonderful question because it goes to the heart of what the Supreme Court is really all about. I mean, the conventional answer, that a ju if that justice were sitting here and answering this question, the conventional answer would be, of course, public opinion has nothing to do with it. We are interpreting the Constitution. We are bound to use our professional judgment. And I think that's an honest, I don't think they're dissembling when they say that. But if you think about the long span of Supreme Court opinions, especially those that touch what we in America call the hot-button issues, the really tough social questions, 
I think in a very curious way the court tends to track, not necessarily opinion polls, not what the newspaper said yesterday, but over a period of time, I think the court is largely in touch with where the country is. An example would be those cases before 1937 when the Supreme Court was trying to stand in the way of social and economic, the New Deal, for example. They were striking down major New Deal measures of Franklin Roosevelt. That could not last, and finally they stepped out of the way. So they finally came into uh, agreement with where the public was. I think that's happening. Now here's where I'll make a rash prediction. It's interesting that every single federal district court so far that's heard a same-sex marriage case, and there have been a number around the country, in every single one of them, the federal district judge has struck down the state law that, that bans same-sex marriage. In, not just in so-called blue states, but in red states, uh, in Nevada, there was a judge, a Republican appointee, a conservative chap who said, sorry, I think it's unconstitutional. I, th I think in time, Suzelle is right that you have to count the votes on the court. But I think opinion is changing on this very rapid. Virginia is an example. Virginia passed a state constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage, and it passed overwhelmingly 60% of the vote. Recent opinion polls in Virginia show that Virginians are divided about 50-50 on the merits of these cases, and for Virginians under 30, those who are polled, two-thirds of them are okay with same-sex marriage. I mean, that's where I think, now this is not true of every part of the country. In the Deep South, you have people who will stand in the barricades against same-sex marriage. But I think over, the, over time, what the Supreme Court does in the name of equal protection or substantive due process, other interpretive parts of the Constitution, over the long haul, those decisions do, in an interesting way, track public opinion. So the Supreme Court, in, the, in that respect, is something of a mirror of, of not individual opinion, but where the country's at. Don? So if I can just supplement that briefly. Um, some say that it does track it, but it lags by about 50 years uh, in terms of public opinion. But certainly when an opinion is written, uh, it will not say that uh, it's tracking public opinion or it will not in any way reflect public opinion. I think that because there is no solid anchor mooring here, consistent with some of the things I pointed out, that this is an area which is especially susceptible to that criticism of our court system, that it in fact is reflective to too great an extent when it should be standing up. We've had lots of unpopular decisions, so I don't say every time. But it's a, a potential criticism because it's hard to find what the legal anchor is, and when you have that much room, then the explanation may well be that it was reflecting public opinion to the common people. Up here, so oh, go ahead. I'd like to draw Professor Howard's views on an unwritten constitution. On, on, unwritten. Unwritten. The question is, Professor um, Howard, uh, give us your views on unwritten constitutions in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so this questioner is asking me to take a position on why you don't have a written constitution. <laughs> I mean, that, that would be a rash thing for me to say. As you know, the tradition of this country has been that custom and tradition and convention and the rest of it have worked well enough indeed. I mean, I'm sure in the 1770s and 80s when Americans wrote constitutions, the English reacted by saying, that's crazy. You can't put it all in a written document. You simply can't sum it up. I would say, again, except for the United Kingdom, that virtually every country in the world has thought they really ultimately have to write it down and have a written constitution. If the Scots vote yes in September, I'm not predicting they will. That's another topic. Oh, I'm not getting into that one. <laughs> Believe me, I have Scottish blood on one side and English blood on the other, and they, my genes war with each other all the time. But if they vote yes in September, they will write a constitution. I feel sure of that. The only other countries I can think of offhand that don't have written constitutions, uh, New Zealand has a Bill of Rights but no complete constitution. Uh, Israel has no written constitution because the political factions simply can't get together. What they've done is fall back on a series of basic laws that take it together sort of to do, do the job. But uh, I'm fascinated that even though this country has no written constitution, 
how it's beginning to edge ever so slightly in the direction of some of the things that <coughs> written constitutions do. A Supreme Court is now in existence. Well, calling it a Supreme Court has certain implications. You have the Human Rights Bill of 1998, which is not John Marshall and Marbury versus Madison, but it does begin to enter, to sort of reinforce the notion that there are external standards by which to judge a law. It's an intermediate sort of thing. Uh, Commonwealth countries do something like, like soft version, if you like, of judicial review. You don't have formal federalism in this country, but you do have devolution, which is its first cousin. So if you think about all the ways in which constitutions operate, something like those things are beginning to be in the air. I'm not predicting you'll wind up with a written constitution, but, but it, it's, I think there's a bit of convergence in the modern world on what constitutions do. There may also be a fundamental um, answer to this, um, such as the one a man in my church gave when confronted with the question of whether he believed in infant baptism. And his response was he was forced to because he'd actually seen it done. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Peter. Um, Peter Bottom now. And the first person asking a question who's neither a professor nor a lawyer nor both. I think the one issue that fascinates me is how far justice allows law to build on it or the other way around. We give, we give one example of a Supreme Court judgment which reversed a previous Supreme Court judgment. Right. That, in theory, was based on the law. In practice, it's probably based on justice. And my guess is the federal courts who've struck down anti-same-sex marriage laws are doing it on justice rather than on law. I ask the question, how is it possible for people in the Supreme Court in their public judgments or in their private discussions to say, do we have to play this game by the rules, or can we do what Tom Denning used to do, which is say, let's go for justice and see if people will support us? That's a... Do you go want ahead. To repeat the yes, question? Professor. Yeah. I, I, I hope every heard, everybody heard what Peter said, because it was too long for me to repeat it. <laughs> okay. I mentioned a moment ago early Supreme Court cases in the 1790s, the first the turn of the 19th century, in which essentially the Supreme Court was saying, even if we had no written constitution, there's certain fundamental things about the idea of civilized government, the rights of a free people, the social compact, natural rights of the like. We would, if, if I took, if our government took your property and gave it to somebody else, that court would have said, you simply can't, even if we had no prohibition on taking a property without compensation, we would be obliged to say government can't do that. Now, we've over the years developed a body of case law so that we now have pigeonholes called equal protection, cruel and unusual punishment, due process, First Amendment, et cetera, et cetera. And so the cases are pretty much put in those pigeonholes, but I think there's still underlying all of that, the notion at which Justices, five of the nine justices of the Supreme Court will simply agree something is simply too much. And something we haven't talked about here today is for the cruel and unusual punishment dates back to the English Bill of Rights, but in the hands of the Supreme Court, over the years it's involved, we haven't abolished capital punishment, some states have, but it's not been abolished across the board, but increasingly the Supreme Court is trimming back the kinds of cases in which the death penalty can be meted out. For example, the somewhat mentally retarded, very youthful offenders, et cetera, et cetera. So they haven't gotten to the point of abolition, but it, it's clear they're looking at these practices. Uh, it, it, the shock the conscience test has been mentioned. Felix Frankfurter once defined, defined due process as that which shocks the, the conscience. Well, could there be a more subjective test than that, and it's clearly a notion of what's just, what's right, what's fair. Is that sort of where your question leads? And, and let me just add one thing to that, and particularly for our law students. Um, I completely agree with Dick that at the end of the day, and with the thrust of Peter's question, that at the end of the day on these hard questions, the cutting edge where the, where the tectonic plates are really joining, and we're looking at ultimately a concept of what is just or what is right. In your briefs, you don't start with that. You start with the cases and the precedents, and that's squeezed out at the very end by very few people. So 
and one of you, I think, is coming to work for us next year. We don't start any argument with what's just. That comes to you. <laughs> that's one, that's one, the one, last one ditch. Brother, one quick comment. Yes. Justice, Chief Justice Earl Warren, back in the 1960s, there would be a case being argued before the court, and it was about procedure in a criminal trial or whatever, and the lawyers would make all these complicated, you know, legalistic arguments. He would lean over the lectern and simply say, but were you fair? And that was, I mean, for him, they cut to the chase and said, well, if you weren't fair, we're going to find a way to say that it was unconstitutional. So, uh, no, no. And of course, Peter, when you're on the side that your fairness is the winning side and your concept of fairness, then that's fine. If you're on the other side of the fairness question, therein lies the enigma, I think Don said, the dilemma. Any other questions? Well, yeah, yes. Um, can I broaden it to another hard question? Um, so how does substantive due process relate to uh, laws connected to terrorism and charges of terrorism? And in particular, the position of aliens in the United States? Sounds like a perfect question for, for Professor Howard. Substantive due process, aliens in the United States, the rights of aliens in the United that States. Thank you for that question because that is, is again one of the hot topics in public and legal debate in America at the moment. If you think about the kinds of cases with which the Supreme Court is not comfortable, clearly these cases that involve moral judgments like same-sex marriage, as they proved last year, they sort of bought time until those cases come back. Uh, they have a lot of cases involving aliens. They've only recently had cases involving terrorists, since 9-11, basically, cases like that. And when those cases began coming to the Supreme Court, for example, from Guantanamo, where there are still detainees from what, 10 years ago and more, uh, the court wasn't willing to say, these people are outside the legal system. They basically say, Justice O'Connor, for example, wrote an opinion saying, well, these detainees at least have the right to come into a federal court and tell their side of the story. They might not get all the complete trappings of procedural due process that a citizen might get in an ordinary criminal justice case, but you can't simply shut them out altogether. But the court was very vague on saying, okay, what does that actually mean in practice? What, what sort of rights can they claim? And so the answer to your question is still not very much more defined today than it was 10 years ago in terms, in terms of terrorism. I think for justices of our Supreme Court, second-guessing the government on matters that seem to impact national security is something in which justices are frankly very nervous. And don't, they, it's as if they're, they're not very competent, they don't feel very, they don't exactly know what's in play, and yet they're not willing to say there are no rights at all. So my answer to your question is vague because I think their answer to that question is vague. And like the standing issue, it allows them a shield from having to reach and discuss those issues if they so choose for the present. But I think the most important question is where it rings. Well, and, and just one more comment on that. Don and I gave a, a lecture at Oxford and at Nuke Hall College in Cambridge on terrorism and Guantanamo and the whole issue of due process, substantive and procedural, with the detainees there and the court's interaction. I, just following it, I think probably most of you read in the newspapers a couple of years ago that the courts in Guantanamo, courts, I wouldn't call them courts, but the military tribunals in Guantanamo, one very brave judge, military member of the panel that was hearing the evidence and the, the detainees were not entitled to, to originally to counsel, they weren't allowed to inspect the evidence, they couldn't hear the witnesses, and I believe it was a colonel said, um, who was in the, the uh, JAG Corps, the, um, the, the lawyer part division of our military system, said this is, this is horrible. This denies every semblance of anybody's vision of due process. So the federal co courts have not gone hugely far, but the federal courts have been somewhat receptive to hearing about these problems of due process and, and bringing some of it into the to the federal courts where the executive has been pretty firm about 
keeping this in the military and out, outside of the civil courts, but a whole other issue. Can I add one historic? Yes, you can. Professor Howard. I want to add one historic, because we began with Magna Carta, one historical <laughs> footnote to our discussion of your, of your question. I, correct me, you historians, if I'm wrong on this, but I think that the English Petition of Right of 1628, among its several provisions complaining about Stuart prerogative, I think one of those provisions was forbidding the trying of civilians in military courts. Is that, 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 I think that's correct. And, and that seems to be, that's an issue that clearly hasn't gone away, as you know, because one of the issues in these modern terrorism cases in America has been the creation of and the use of military commissions. So I think we're uh, about to see the principal. Yeah. Yes? Isn't that a good moment to quote Mrs. Palin's description of the order uh, You're the one that told me. Tell me, my, this is my mother. For everybody. <laughs> 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 Any questions from your mother are unfair. But please tell everyone, I can't remember. Well, as recently as a few days ago, I, it's our understanding that Mrs. Palin said waterboarding is baptism. Ah, so my mother says that Sarah Palin was quoted in the newspaper as saying waterboarding, the form of torture, is baptism. Baptizing terrorists. So, baptizing the terrorists. So, Likes the traditional I will, I will, on that note, I will turn it over to Principal Wayne. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers this evening for exceptionally interesting and thought-provoking presentations, and to thank also members of our audience here for their questions and participation. Um, it's made, the, the whole evening has made me much more aware than I was of the cultural malleability of the law, uh, and that malleability over very tight timetables in some of the cases you've been looking at. So I'm going to go away both rejoicing and rather nervous. Uh, rejoicing because so many of the examples you've given are of a liberalizing of the law in ways that for many are emancipatory. Uh, but I think you've also emphasized the instability of the law um, and the big questions about uh, what about those people where one person's emancipation is another person's moral problem. Uh, very, very difficult and interesting territory. So thank you so much for elucidating it. And everyone, do please come and join us for a drink and to continue this conversation in Talbot Hall, which is just one quadrangle away. Thank you so much.